Yes. So welcome to this uh, webinar, this fifth critical webinar uh, with Klima for Frihandel. Today we have Esteban Savart with us and we're going to talk about uh, gas, we're going to talk about fracking and we're going to hear stories from the front line. We're also going to talk about how we can mobilize in Europe and in Denmark to resist fracking um, in the global south. So today's webinar will be recorded and we'll upload the webinar uh, on YouTube in the coming week under the YouTube channel Global Action to so be able to see or review the, um, the presentation. Um, yeah, and if you do not feel comfortable with the recording, then please write Birgitte Deal in the chat and she'll tell you how, to, how you can be anonymous. So, yes, who are we? Um, we are a group of activists from Global Action uh, who gathered around the theme of climate and free trade. And we focus, oh, I just have to admit someone. We try to shed light on how free trade and rules within the trade system hinders climate action. and. During this lockdown, uh, we had to cancel a lot of our events, uh, which were to take place here in Copenhagen. Therefore, we've moved to this online media and we are doing a series of critical webinars. But Global Action is, uh, is a social movement, a solidarity organization working with social movements around the world. Uh, we work to fight the structural causes of global inequality and we work together with um, peasants, with um, local solidarity movements and movements against extractive activities around the globe to show solidarity and we also work politically here in Denmark. This fall we'll have a, an activist school, a political activist school here in Denmark and where we'll also discuss these themes and we have invited guests uh, to come and participate in this school and we hope to see a lot of you. Please go to our Facebook page to see coming uh, events and for more information on this activist school and also for our upcoming webinar. Next week we'll have a webinar with um, Ilham from Mozambique where we'll talk about the Danish gas interest in Mozambique and how it's affecting the local communities down there. Yeah, so Esteban is gonna present the next 40 minutes or so, and afterwards, uh, Birgitte is gonna, Birgitte from Global Action is gonna give a brief introduction to how uh, we work, or how the Danish gas um, movement is mobilizing, and what's happening here in Denmark, and then we'll open for 10 or 15 minutes to discussion uh, for all of you. If you have questions during um, the webinar, please write them in the chat and we'll try to take them underway or after the presentations. Yeah, and I'll just see if I can get back and start your Yes, here they are. Um, so Esteban, I'll give the word to you. Just tell me next and I'll go for the next, um, next Thank slide. Thank you very much. Can you hear me there? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you very much, you guys, for organizing all of this global action. Um, my name is Esteban Servat. I am a scientist from Argentina. Uh, but right now I am connecting from Germany, where I have been living for the past one year or so, since I had to run away from my country after fighting fracking and building a, a movement in the, in the west side of the country, which I will tell you the story now. Uh, next slide, please. So for those of you who don't know fracking, to put it very broadly, 
fracking has come to the world to save the fossil fuel industry from its extinction, which was supposed to happen as we many years ago were supposed to reach a point called peak oil in world history, after which the price of oil should go up as the resource would be running out, and therefore the, the cost of renewable energies would become they would become more attractive for investment as the price of oil would go up indefinitely. But uh, fracking came to the world uh, at full speed in the years 2000, toward the end of, of the decade of 2000. And what it consists of is going much deeper into the ground and exploiting until then unavailable uh, reservoirs, basin called tight and unconventional which are, are much, much deeper than the conventional basins of oil and gas. And in this uh, situation, the gas and oil, uh, their particles, they are trapped in, as bubbles in the rock, in a very hard, tight rock that can be two, three, four thousand meters deep. In order to extract this, fracking developed um, a horizontal drilling technique, as you can see in this graph which is not just the vertical well, but then it goes horizontally. It can go vertically three, four thousand meters like it does in Argentina. And then it can go horizontally for many hundreds of meters where it uses explosives to fracture that rock and a lot of water and uh, more than 600 chemicals, which many of them are highly toxic for human and animal health, for the soil, for the water, for the air. So it contaminates pretty much everything around it, and it contaminates the aquifers in the process with these chemicals and with, with the materials that they get from deep underground. When they, they use this mix of chemicals, water, and, and a very fine sand, which is also very dangerous because it, it makes a lot of respiratory harm. This fine sand has the function of blocking the fractures when they were open so that they don't get blocked again and all the gas and oil can be released and extracted. Um, also, when they pull this material out of this depth, there's usually radioactive elements which are very dangerous, such as radon, that can be volatilized and travel hundreds of miles and cause cancer at extremely low concentrations. So fracking has come, the fracking is allowing the world to have a lot more oil and gas, but at a time when we should be going in the exact opposite direction. And as I will show you soon, uh, this is a major uh, driver of climate change, and it's the main reason we have to stop it, as well as all the local devastation that it causes wherever it's applied. Next, please. So to the left, you can see a, a, a picture from the air of a, a mine. It's like a minefield. This is a fracking site in the US. That's how it looks. Because fracking, as I said, uh, it can only drill a few hundred meters horizontally. So they need to make wells very close to one another. And the lifespan of each well is not very long. It's no more than five years. And about 80% of the product is extracted during the first year. And then production declines tremendously after that. So they need to keep drilling and pumping millions of cubic meters of, um, uh, mi sorry, millions of liters of water deep into the, into the soil, which cannot be recovered. It cannot be used after that. It has no way to recycle that. So all of these materials are pumped back into the soil with a lot of chemicals that are very, very toxic. Uh, next, please. Uh, one major product of fracking is gas. And the reason for this slide is that Europe is a big player in the, in the expansion of fracking all over the world. And it's a big player mostly in the way of consuming this gas in the form of LNG, which stands for liquefied natural gas. Liquef liquefied because in order to be shipped, most like the biggest uh, producer in the world of frac gas is the United States. And in order to ship this gas overseas, they need to liquefy it, meaning compress it more than 600 times and freezing it to minus 120 Celsius degrees so that it can be kept in a low enough volume to ship large quantities of, of it in huge transatlantic ships like the ones you see uh, in the image 
which are also very contaminating. They use very heavy fuels, and you can imagine the carbon footprint of having to transport this halfway across the globe to Europe and to Asia. Next, please. I was telling you fracking is a major cause of global warming and NASA and scientists have determined that it's a leading contributor of methane emissions to the atmosphere. In the lower image, you can see pictures taken by, with a special camera by the organization Earthworks from the US, which this is from a fracking operation. You can see on the, on the left, with the normal eye, you see nothing, but under this infrared camera, you can see a lot of methane and other greenhouse gas emissions that are being constantly produced and released intentionally into the air in a process called gassing and, and for releasing and venting. And sometimes they're burning this when they have too much and they have to let it out. So it's, it's just a lot of gas that is released along the process, as I will show you in the next slide, please. So there was, um, there was a study in, in August of last year that was groundbreaking because many people knew fracking was bad, but um, I would bet that most people don't know about this study. They don't know, it's not just bad locally for the devastation that it causes, but it's, it's really bad at a global level. And this scientific study from Cornell University by a world leading expert, Dr. Howard, um, determined that fracking is responsible for over 50% of all of the world's increased methane emissions from, from fossil fuels, and over one third when you, com we, you take into account all kinds of emissions, including biological sources, over the past decade. Which means over the past 10 years, which is when fracking uh, uh, boomed uh, out of, uh, you know, after it was developed in the year 2008, 2009, it went into full, uh, full mode into the, in the US. And this study is only taking into account North American fracking, not even considering Argentina and other places. And just over the last 10 years, this has released so much methane that is really uh, responsible for, for this amount, while at the same time, the United Nations, the IPCC, the COP are saying nothing about it. They are alarming about record emissions of methane, which is 85% worse than CO2 for global warming on a 20 year period. And yet they don't mention one of the biggest culprits for this. And the reason is there is a lot of money, there is a lot of lobby, and the biggest corporations in the world uh, are behind it, not to mention the power of the United States and Donald Trump. Next, please. Uh, I must also mention, we went to the summit in Madrid and participated and made a presentation at the social summit with the environmental movements. And the COP had actually censored the, the topic of fracking. They did not allow any presentation, including our own or anybody else's that even mentioned the word fracking. Um, just to give you an idea, the carbon footprint, many people, you may have heard that uh, many people in the media, the governments, they're saying that gas is the way to go. It's a clean transition, a clean fuel for the future. that has a lower carbon footprint than coal and others, but this is false. When you consider shale gas, which is frack gas, which is the biggest source of gas and what is going to be more and more over time as the shale revol revolution is changing the energy matrix of the world because it's just making so much gas and oil available, Shale gas has been shown by science to be 44% worse than coal in its carbon footprint for the planet. So it's worse than, than, than coal, but it's being sold as the best, as the cleanest, but it's actually the worst of the worst of the fossil fuel industry. Next, please. The legal status of Europe is pretty much restricted everywhere in, in Western Europe. This graph is from before it was it had a moratorium passed in in the UK, but as you can see, in most of uh, of Western Europe, fracking is not allowed yet. It is the companies of many of these superpowers that are fracking the world, including my country. It is uh, Winterschall from Germany, Repsol from Spain, Total from France, Shell from the Netherlands, Pan American Energy from British Capital 
and others that are responsible for the biggest fracking operations in the global south while they cannot frack at home. And as I will show you soon, they are shipping the royalties, the money, but also they're shipping the, the gas in the form of LNG for Europe to consume this cheap gas that is really stained in blood and there is something that we can do to stop it from Europe. Next, please. Uh, among the local devastation caused by fracking, one of the most notorious is water contamination. You may have seen documentaries such as Gasland, which is the image on the top left. People can set their water on fire in the US. The right image is from a river in Australia, also catching fire from the contamination with methane and other chemicals from uh, fracking a nearby fracking operation. And needless to say, the death of uh, livestock, animals, and a lot of illnesses for people. Next, please. Another big issue with uh, fracking is the extreme consumption of water. So it uses up to 45 to 60 millions of liters uh, of water per well during the lifespan of a five-year lifespan of one well. And as I showed you before, uh, this is done on a very huge scale. So it's not one well, but thousands or hundreds of wells per site. So in arid regions, in regions where water is not abundant, and like it is in many places of the world ever more, as the world is getting, many places are getting more desertified due to global warming, fracking is only making things a lot worse. And in the region where I came from, actually is is making it into a desert is is stealing the water from the people it's illegal and yet the government is in bed with the companies and it's just uh, openly saying that they use no water it's the only place in the world they can do fracking with no water uh, they just lie and, and manipulate the population with the media which are often the owners of the fracking companies as well as i will show you later uh, next please the consequences for human and animal health are, couldn't get any worse. It was shown by a study from scientists in, and health decisions in New York, which, which was used to ban fracking in New York State, um, that living within 16 kilometers of a fracking well is uh, linked with high risk of a lot of birth defects um, that are lethal and not to mention cancer, leukemia, and pretty much uh, terminal or very bad diseases of all, uh, all body uh, systems, reproductive, immunological, nervous system, and so on. Um, so whatever you look at it from, it's just, uh, it's just bringing death everywhere uh, you apply fracking. Next, please. As if all of that was not enough, fracking is also being shown by science to induce earthquakes, even in areas that are not uh, earthquake prone. Um, for example, in, the, in England, the reason they put the moratorium was because it was causing a lot of earthquakes. And this was because this was after they had already banned it for some time, after they suffered 17 earthquakes in nine days uh, before that in the year 2018, I believe. And um, in, the, in the top images, you can see some graphs of Oklahoma where in the US, where you can see after the inception of fracking around the year 2009, how the number and intensity of earthquakes go up is the red line. And um, to the right, you can see also from the period up, up until 2009, the number and intensity of the earthquakes was nothing compared to the year 2014-15, where you see how they have multiplied in numbers and in size. Next, please. Um, as I said, you know, fracking is taking us from where we need to go and going to where we don't need to go. We should be, you know, the price of oil without fracking, the price of oil would have gone up and renewable energies would have become more attractive for investors. But what happened and what is happening is the exact opposite. Fracking is being financed by debt, by a bubble, because it's not even profitable. It takes a lot of energy to extract these resources through fracking. But it's being done as a national uh, ambition and national interest of the U.S., it's been financed at 0% interest loans and it's being subsidized 
And this is why right now we are facing a bubble about to burst with fracking, which may take down the entire financial system, which I will explain later. Um, but uh, again, Trump, he's putting uh, tariffs on renewable energies so that they cannot be developed and subsidizing fracking and imposing frack gas uh, all over the world, pushing Europe to buy American frack gas with the ambition to really dominate the world in his own words. Next, please. Unfortunately, my country happens to have 12% of the global proven reserves of uh, shale, gas, and oil in the world. So, uh, next, please. We have um, a basin which is bigger than Denmark in size, called Baca Muerta. Uh, and the, even the UN has said that it would be a methane bomb for the planet and has asked Argentina, even though they don't talk about fracking, but they have talked about the, the emissions for the planet and they have told Argentina to please keep it under the ground because it will consume more than 11% of the total left carbon budget for the planet. Just Argentina's fracking basin can consume more than 11% of the total budget we have left. And yet, the, the, the countries that rule the United Nations, the biggest ones, are the same countries that are the owners of these companies that are fracking in Argentina, like the UK. Look at the article below, and you will see this hypocrisy. This is just for, from a couple months ago, where it was shown by The Guardian that the UK was uh, misdirecting one billion pounds to support fracking in Argentina, one billion pounds that were meant to be invested in green energy. This is the type of hypocrisy that we face with the UN and with Europe and the global north, which we can do a lot to change uh, in Europe. Next, please. Um, recently, a few months ago, Argentina, because of these fracking operations, was able to make its first ever gas exports. And out of those gas exp LNG exports, uh, one of them came to, to Europe, to Spain. So the exports of LNG from fracking are already beginning. And of course, the US and other places are already, for much longer, they have been exporting their frack gas to Europe, which is one of the world's biggest markets, consuming about one third of all of the world's gas. Next, please. To give you a little x-ray of the situation, this is uh, an image of Vaca Muerta, which lies beneath several Argentinian provinces in the west of the country next to Chile. And here you can see some of the companies that have the biggest chunks of land attributed for them to frack. Among them, you have uh, Total from France, Pan American Energy from England, and of course, some giants from the US, Exxon and, and uh, and you have uh, uh, Chevron from the US, there is Shell from the Netherlands, there is Winterschall from Germany, all of the ones I mentioned before, but they're among the biggest ones that are, that are causing a lot of disease, uh, they are displacing indigenous communities which are paying the highest price for this fracking bubble, and uh, they are leaving us with an eternal uh, environmental uh, intoxication and taking all the resources and the wealth and then just uh, leaving complete devastation. And not only that, they are subsidized by the Argentinian government. Such is the level of corruption. They have bought politicians for them to even subsidize them in our own destruction. Next, please. So my personal story, I was not an environmental activist. I was a scientist living in the US. I was working in the Silicon Valley for 10 years. And then I moved back to my country to build an eco village, tired of the life of consumerism and industrialism of the US. And I bought a piece of land in Mendoza province, which is a wine country in the west of Argentina, um, which was famous for its, its defense of the environment. 12 years ago, they banned mega mining, which is the mining for silver and gold. It's very toxic, very destructive, blowing up entire mountaintops. 
and um, people mobilized by the tens of thousands because they have very little water, it's a desert, and they have in their DNA the consciousness to defend that water. They're not even activists, they're just the whole population mobilizes. It's a great uh, thing to see. So um, I bought a, a piece of land there to build an eco village and we were beginning to do so until uh, in 2018, the government brought fracking to Mendoza because Mendoza, unfortunately, is part of Vaca Muerta and it had not yet been uh, exploited. So when they brought fracking, um, I found out that, um, that this, this fracking operations, the first pilot wells, were already contaminating the aquifers, the water tables, and the government was keeping the study secret. The environmental impact study that was conducted was being kept secret and uh, it was prevented from them to show it at a public hearing where fracking was approved. And um, I, got, I got this from a whistleblower. I managed to get a copy of this report. And I thought, okay, well, the world needs uh, an environmental version of WikiLeaks. So we created EcoLeaks in a very South American fashion. We didn't have any of the technology and infrastructure of WikiLeaks, but uh, we thought that this needed to be published. So with a very simple website and a Facebook page, we published this report. And this led to an all-out war with the government, but also building uh, the biggest, at the time it became the biggest movement in the world against fracking, a truly mass movement with tens of thousands of people demonstrating and blocking roads and marching all over the province. For example, in the town I was living in, that I was only 30,000 inhabitants, we mobilized uh, more than 13,000 people, um, more almost half of the population against fracking and uh, this uh, also turned me into a, a source of persecution for the government so the a target they targeted me with criminal cases that they made up they planted drugs in our farm and made media operations saying we we were drug dealers and should be put in jail they invaded our farms sent people with fake documents to claim ownership and uh, destroyed part of the farm with a government uh, bulldozer um, eventually, I won all of these cases, but also they made uh, uh, insane charges like public intimidation for saying that I was causing panic because they made me responsible for the whole movement. So saying that I was causing panic on the people by telling the truth of what fracking causes, which is documented scientifically all over the world, and is the basis for the prohibition it has in Europe and in, in states like, like New York. Um, so that was the, the, the story of Ecoleaks. Next, please. As I was saying, for the next few months and the next year or so, it was a lot of people on the streets, but also a lot of government persecution, not just of myself. They began to persecute anyone that would begin to annoy them, to challenge them. And many other people besides me had to leave before me as well for other places. Some moved to Buenos Aires, some moved to other provinces. The government managed to approve a code of conduct at the province legislature, which is resembling a code of conduct we had in the dictatorship days in the 70s, where they can put you in jail for saying something on Facebook, on social media, for if, if they interpret that you insulted the governor or some public official, basically really limiting the freedom of expression and uh, putting people in jail arbitrarily depending on, on who is annoying them and challenging their interest. Next, please. Uh, social media was a key tool for us, despite what we all think of Facebook, it was great. Even though Facebook has censored us in, in, at some point, we were able to get the word out because all of the media were silent and actually the biggest media group of Mendoza were also the owners of the fracking company. So the conflicts of interest are huge, but through WhatsApp and through Facebook, here this is, a, everyone is invited to join, it's a Facebook group against fracking that became the biggest in the world. It has 56, more, more than 56,000 members and it's really our big, biggest platform that the government cannot control and censor fully yet 
So we go, things go viral when we put them there and we can call for actions to take place. Um, and also WhatsApp was very useful to share uh, information. Next, please. Um, Fridays for Future, the teenagers have also taken on the fight in Argentina um, as uh, they came into existence uh, kind of in the middle of last year in Argentina and in, in Mendoza, they really went to the forefront and they really did a massive strike. Hundreds of them pay, uh, stroke, didn't go to school, but instead of going to a park or to um, some place like it happens in, uh, in, in Europe, they went and blocked the road, a national road, which is the means to achieve the goal. Uh, 12 years ago, this is how the people were able to stop mining and they knew it, it was their parents that did it, their grandparents. So they really went and blocked the roads all day. And as you can see them in the picture here, the government sent the police, they couldn't get them out. Then they sent the army, they couldn't get them out. Then they went to the schools to try to get the names of the people who didn't go to school, to persecute them. And next slide, please. They even threatened to disappear them. Uh, the governor, during a political act for his uh, campaign, his re-election for his, his election campaign, he, he had them uh, threatened with disappearing, which those of you who know Argentina, you may have heard that we had 30,000 people disappear during the 70s that were tortured and killed by the dictatorship. So it's a very heavy thing to do, especially to minors, but this is the situation that Mendoza is facing. Next, please. And this is the counterpart. Uh, Mendoza and Argentina is far away from us, but uh, everything is very deeply connected. And all of these uh, persecutions and, and displacement of indigenous communities and death threats and incarcerations, and even deaths in some cases, not in Mendoza, but other places of Vaca Muerta, uh, could not go on if there was not a consuming market for all this gas. And the consuming market, the biggest in the world next to China, is Europe. Europe consumes about one third of all of the world's LNG. And as you can see, this is expanding rapidly. Um, there is a plan. There is a plan to substitute oil for gas, which all of the oil companies are part of this campaign. You may have seen it all over the media that gas is the clean energy of the future, the transition fuel, and LNG is the way they plan to do that. So this LNG terminals, LNG terminal for import, what it does is it regasifies the gas that comes liquefied in these in this ships. So it warms it up again and then injects it into the pipeline to feed Europe or every country. So as you see, the terminals are popping up all over Europe, but also we are popping up and we are taking action to stop it. And already there's been one success and hopefully many more to come in the next slides I'll tell you. Uh, next, please. But before that, I must tell you, this is very important, especially right now, as it may be fracking, ironically, the thing that will take down the US economy. So fracking is a bubble about to burst. And this is a pretty prophetic article from the New York Times from September of last year, before this crisis. By the end of last year, um, more than 90% of all US bankruptcies were uh, oil and gas companies, fracking companies. The New York Times was warning that fracking had been fueled by debt and, and subsidies by the US government and the biggest banks because the intention was to keep it alive, to produce a lot of oil, to bring down the price of oil in the world and not depend in the Middle East so much, and also for the US to become a superpower and the biggest exporter of oil and gas in the world. And under Trump's um, government, he has come up with the, the policy of world dominance, world energy, American energy dominance of the world. And this is, as I will show you on the White House, official website. So um, right now, because of the, the price of oil, fracking is, is not uh, profitable, and even, it's even less when the barrel of oil is about 60, is below $60 a barrel. So um, right now that the barrel is $10, 
the fracking companies are set to collapse and they're already beginning to collapse in a big way. But when they do, they will take down with them the entire financial system. The banks, JP Morgan, Citibank, Bank of America have invested billions that they will not be able to recover as these companies are going under the water. Next, please. So this is the Wall Street Journal, the most important reference for Wall Street. And as you see, this is even, these are news from last year. They were already warning that the fracking companies were in a lot of trouble making bonds and all ways they could to try to get money as Wall Street was closing the doors on them. Next, please. And this is a more recent one, as you can see, um, there's already big bankruptcies going on. Whiting Petroleum became the, the first major shale bankruptcy happening recently. This is during this crisis. And there's many, many more to come. Next, please. Um, there's also the, the trade war with China, which closed its LNG imports at the beginning of the trade war. Oh, hello. I think you switched the... I don't see the slides anymore. Or did I? Sorry, yeah, it was me. Um, so China, during the trade war, closed down by imposing 25% tariffs on the American LNG. They pretty much closed down the market to it. And that's the biggest uh, energy market in the world. So that's when Trump, next slide, please. That's when Trump doubled down on Europe. That's when Trump started actually making threats on to European governments that if they don't build these LNG terminals to buy the American frac gas, uh, he would impose tariffs on, for example, Germany's car manufacturing industry. So, for example, this is also the New York Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal, Merkel, who initially had said no, uh, changed course, uh, gave into pressure and said yes to build these three terminals to, to buy this American gas, which Germany does not need. Next, please. And the same is going on uh, with many other countries. And as I told you before, American energy dominance. This is a screenshot from the whitehouse.gov website, unleashing American energy dominance. And uh, they're bragging about this openly. Next, please. Uh, this is official data from the government of the U.S. showing how the U.S., thanks to the shale revolution, has um, has really gone up a lot in the production to become number one in the world for gas and oil. Next, please. And for you to have an idea of how how big of a game changer this is, keep this in mind. The U.S., if everything was to continue like it was up until the coronavirus pandemic, is set to become, to provide more than half of the world gas by 2035. So this is more and more of the gas of the world will come from fracking, from the US, from Argentina and other places. Next, please. And they go, they are so cynical and they go as far as to name this gas, freedom gas, in a marketing campaign that is unprecedented, it's a fraud. So they're calling the worst of the worst of the fossil fuel industry freedom gas. And Rick Perry, the, back then he was the energy secretary, he said, he went as far as to say, 70 years ago, 75 years ago, we liberated Europe from the Nazis with our army. And now again, we are bringing freedom to Europe in the form of our freedom gas. Next, please. So this fraud, this is the environmental fraud of the century. And it has two big lies. One is that this is energy transition. And I encourage you to Google LNG transition and you will see pretty much nothing but this campaign, official websites, official government websites like this. Uh, the bottom one is from the official government, uh, German government agency for trade and investment touting the great qualities of LNG for the energy transition. And at the top, you see how they're bragging the new EU energy chief is backing gas as part of the transition. They can only go on with this if the public is uninformed. So if the great environmental movements that are growing in Europe, like nowhere else, were to become aware of this information, uh, it would be a matter of time until we could focus all of our strengths and our power and our numbers 
into defeating this, and I'm sure that we can do that. Next, please. The second big lie of all of this is, is that this is somehow part of a Cold War that will bring independence from Russia. They are trying to scare people saying that they should not depend on Russian gas, and instead that this will save them from Russian dependency from their conventional gas from Russia that comes in pipelines. But the truth is that Russia is playing also a, a two-pronged strategy, and they, they are selling LNG. They have a private company called Novatech, which is owned by, um, by Russian um, uh, oligarchs, connected many to Putin, as, as far as I know, which are making a killing on the LNG business, and they're benefiting and they're investing in some of these LNG terminals as well. So this Cold War uh, dialectic of, um, of the US versus Russia is only a show, it's false. They are in agreement about the plan for the LNG expansion uh, in Europe. Next, please. And now the positive side, um, the movements that are coming around to stop it. And in Germany, some students from Fridays for Future began a signature collecting campaign that was the beginning to try to stop these three terminals from being built. Next, please. When I got in touch with them, and we tried to organize uh, the first protest against this, which was a very little time, but we managed to make a lot of noise. And we went to the, the German Bundesrat, which is like the House of Commons, I believe, in English, and where they were making the decision to fund with public money, because a big part of the investment for all of these LNG terminals is with our taxpayers' money. So um, they collected over 100,000 signatures. Here, the president of the Bundesrat came out to receive them, smiled, and said thank you. And then he went in and voted for the terminals to be built and financed. Um, Next slide, please. But it was the first uh, case that showed that we need to come together, and there was uh, a lot of environmental movements coming together at the action, and, and the Galen, the Fridays for Future, uh, Extinction Rebellion, Fossil Free, people from the Green New Deal, and others. And at least we put it into the media. We started shedding light on a very obscure topic that most media say nothing about. And when they say something about, it's on a positive light to sell it to us as a, as a clean future, which is not anything but that. So we need to multiply this and also to unite. Next, please. Uh, in Sweden, we had the first victory, which is where I met one of you ladies that organized the, the web, this webinar. And we blocked the port of Gothenburg for a whole day with about 500 activists from all over Europe, from many different movements. And this civil disobedience action had a lot of impact. It was all over the Swedish media, the national media. And soon after that, the government had to make a decision about this LNG terminal that was being built. And all of the pressure and work that had been done to, to, to stop it was successful. And uh, they denied the permit for the LNG terminal to be connected to the grid. So that was the first victory stopping this LNG invasion of Europe with frac gas. Next, please. Then there was the case of Ireland, where um, also I had met an activist from Ireland who was fighting against one of these terminals. That's going to be one of the biggest in Europe, the LNG, Shannon LNG, destroying a, a sanctuary of native life in the west coast of Ireland. And I went there and I held, we, we wallpapered the, um, with Extinction Rebellion and other movements. The Ministry of the Environment also made a lot of noise put the issue on the front page of some papers, got a high profile support for the, for the action. And also soon after that, I was able to meet with Pope Francis and got his support as well. He had been supportive of our fight in Mendoza. And as you know, he's been a big figure in environmental fight. And I also put that picture there together with the Extinction Rebellion picture to say that in this type of fight, it's a survival fight. I understand that many activists may not like the Pope and they may have many reasons not to like him or the church. But at a time when we are fighting a survival fight, we cannot be picky of whether we don't like Extinction Rebellion because they are too radical or the Pope because he's too conservative. We need to employ all available tools. And it was actually very important to get his support because it made a, 
um, a landslide caused uh, an earthquake in the political uh, world in Ireland, especially among conservative politicians that are Catholic and are pushing frack gas. So it was very, very helpful to get that support as well. Next, please. And then the most recent action that we did, and to me the most important yet, is uniting the global south with the global north. Because they are united in, uh, in, every, every, in every other aspect. The, the, pro the product is extracted and is stained with the blood and suffering of the global south for it to be consumed in Europe and keep fueling these fossil fuel companies while the population can remain unaware because the media are keeping the attention somewhere else. So we connected four countries last February, February 21st, we did a global action in connecting Argentina, Spain, Barcelona had been the port of destination of the first ever frac gas export of my country. So we decided to, to get together in Barcelona with many environmental movements and did a big demonstration marching from the port where the frac gas had arrived to the Argentinian consulate where the consul first, for the first time ever in the biggest consulate of Argentina in the world, because the biggest population of Argentinians are outside of Argentina, is in Barcelona. The consul, for the first time ever, because of the pressure, he came out and welcomed us, took us in for a talk, and received our letter, and at least was uh, officially notified of the, of the issue. Same in Argentina, what they did is they went to the Spain consulate to, you know, it's a strategy, if we can start involving the foreign representatives of the countries that have stakes, they have interest through their companies, they're complicit in the destruction of, of our land, but their country has banned fracking, they're in a very tough position. Like especially now, Spain has committed to banning fracking nationwide, so we, we should hold them accountable. Why are you doing this to us then? And especially connect and build empathy in the people and uh, get the activists connected between the South and the North. And in the case of the USA, Texas, um, there's indigenous communities whose land is being destroyed and uh, sacred sites are being violated to build these LNG export terminals. Texas is the world capital of fracking, the birthplace of fracking. And it's a very tough fight for them because culturally Texas is the world of oil. So people are putting a very tough fight to stop these LNG exports, which are confirmed that their destination is Ireland. The confirmed destination of the Rio Grande LNG terminal that is being built in Texas is, Shan is a Cork LNG, which is another uh, project for an LNG terminal in, in Ireland. So again, they also mobilized at the same time. And the folks in Ireland went to the American embassy, which is where the picture you can see there, they also went to the Argentinian embassy in solidarity. And all of this just made a lot of noise with no need for money. Even if the media are trying to cover it up, we have social media, we make videos and share them. And it was just one first step that could be small because we didn't plan it with a lot of time. But um, maybe we can build upon that. And it's not just fracking, but we can use this as a template to connect the environmental and any social fight of the global south, which is usually linked to a company of the global north. So next time someone in Asia or Africa is fighting a, a mine or some other company that is uh, exploiting and abusing the workers to ship the money and the product for it to be consumed in Europe, Europe has something to do. And it's not ideological, it's not words, it's something practical, it's something very simple. And I think we should try to um, to get together and do these concrete actions we can, which can really save lives of the Global South activists, can really give them power because they are the most invisible fights in the world. Next, please. Yeah, and just to say that we have uh, 10 minutes with 10 to 6, so perhaps we should, yes, I don't I know. Think I think that's the second to last one, so I'm okay. almost done. Yeah, or third to last one. And this is, a, just so you know, there is a project for a global fracking ban, which I urge everyone to support in any way you can. Um, this didn't go very far because the United Nations refused to, the president, the, yeah, the president of the UN refused to receive it. So the Secretary General 
didn't receive it, but we have to keep pushing until they do. Next, please. And this is just to close. Um, you know, I was saying that in the global south, they have the most invisible because the most invisible fights, and under that invisibility, the people can be killed, tortured, disappeared, persecuted, displaced. But in Europe, we have a lot of power, and environmental movements of Europe get a lot of press, usually, and they get a lot of, or much more than in the global south. So if we can do things in a, in a European capital like Berlin, or in, or in Denmark, in Copenhagen, or anywhere in Europe, especially if we do it coordinated in many places at once, like going to the embassy of, let's say, Congo, when the people in Congo are fighting a gold mine. And then it's much less likely that the, fi the people fighting in Congo will get killed for this because there will be global repercussions, which to us are, they have no cost. We just have to mobilize to their embassy, submit, give them a letter, make a lot of uh, social media action. And this in turn will make people in Congo more, uh, it, will give, it will encourage them to mobilize because few people take action when there is a lot of risk of being killed. This is what killed the movement in Argentina that people were afraid, they began to stay at home. The government managed to install fear in the people. But if we can give them encouragement by making sure that there will be a, a protective halo around them by giving visibility and support uh, to whatever happens to them, and from Europe we can do that, and we can actually stop all of these uh, destructive uh, industries very it's a pretty simple thing and it doesn't take i think it's not enough to request and demand uh, commitments for reducing emissions and all the things that people here have been demanding rightly so from the governments but the governments are lying the politicians are are con artists they will give you this and then they will break it they will find excuses they will not meet and europe is really what is it doing it's exporting its emissions it's just okay we're not going to frack we're going to reduce our emissions here but we're going to buy this frack gas from from the us from argentina and so on so it's the same and in this case unlike colonial times of the 19th century this time it will come back to bite you because this time there's only one planet and whatever you're doing, if it's just a, it's a fake commitment to reduce your emissions locally, but, uh, but increase them globally, there will be no other place to go. So we need, unless we, the people, the populations, really demand something that is specific, we need to bring the specific demands, close this plant in Congo, close these operations of Wintersal and Shell in Argentina, and really, hold them accountable and make their shares go down if they continue to do that and apply so much pressure until they have to, to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Esteban. I'm just gonna stop sharing. And then I'm gonna quickly give the words to Begide. And I see that it's, it's four to six now. So those of you who are maybe in a hurry to do something at six, you feel free to leave uh, the webinar, but I think we can continue to another 15 minutes discussing what we can actually do in Denmark. Um, so yeah, the words is yours, begin. Okay, I think. Yes. Just, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just gonna do it brief. Um, first of all, I think fracking uh, was something that was also on the agenda in Denmark some years ago, and it's an example of. Uh, protests that were super successful, uh, which means fracking is not really on the agenda in Denmark anymore. Um, but it's also an example of how we then outsource these things to other places, as Esteban has just said. Um, and therefore, when we fight uh, dirty industries or extractivism in Denmark, we also need to support the struggles around the world. Um, can you hear me? I'm a little unsure on my internet. Cool. Um, a few examples of uh, protest against gas that takes place from Denmark is in Global Action, for example, there is a um, gas activist group uh, that support um, people in Mozambique fighting a big gas project where we see the same with um, profit and, and um, gas going to uh, Europe, um, but the consequences hitting in Mozambique. Um, 
we also have a project in Denmark. It's not LNG and it's, I don't think it's fragging, but it's the new Baltic pipe that's being built across Denmark. And there's a group mobilizing around that as well um, to, yeah, to stop the greenwashing that gas is part of. And I'm not gonna say more, but I see people <laughs> here that I think are part of these groups. So I think you can write in the chat or you can always text us uh, on the email that you use to sign up. Um, and we can put you in touch if you wanna join any of these groups. Um, and also, if you want to join uh, civil disobedience actions, as Esteban mentioned in Sweden, or when we go block shell or anything, just get in touch. Um, yeah. Then shortly, uh, LNG is what is mentioned a lot when we talk about fragging, and that's what was um, successfully protested against in Sweden as well, in Gothenburg. Um, LNG is, has come to Denmark as well, and people are trying to put it on the agenda. Um, and new uh, terminals in the harbors are popping up. Uh, so there are targets around Denmark with harbors, but there, um, it's also someone like, it, what is called Marine uh, Development Center uh, is pushing for this agenda. And they are located near Mask here um, in Copenhagen. Um, and then Ørstel has been involved but are actually divesting now because economically it's not feasible for them. And I think that is interesting also on top of what you said, Esteban, that I didn't know of the economy in this. Yeah. So I think that's what I want to say in this brief time, but uh, get in touch. <laughs> Thank you, Birgitte. Um I can see that in the chat, Matilde asked, uh, 25 minutes ago or so about um, why gas is seen as a transition fuel and I can see there's been a debate um, in the chat about that. I don't know if there's any other questions otherwise um, I propose that we if anyone in the uh, meeting is active in some of these activities in Denmark and would like to elaborate a bit on what we're doing here and how to take action um, as elaborated to what Birgitte said, feel free to raise your hands or, or go, yeah, or say something. Yeah, you can see Anna. Hi, I just wanted to say if um, anyone in here is from Jutland and wants to do something towards uh, Baltic Pipe, they should get in touch with me. But if everyone's from Copenhagen, then yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can explain a bit about what you're doing in, in general. Uh, yeah, we're not doing so much now because of Corona, but we were talking about maybe we should make a camp uh, in Southern Jutland at some point. Uh, and get in touch with people who are affected by this locally because many of us are from Aarhus but we know people in Köln and other places nearer to where the gas line is going to be so yeah we haven't decided what we're going to do because it depends who wants to join and what they want to do but uh, we have talked about it has to be uh, together with people who are going to be affected by the gas line and whose local area it actually is. Nice. Um, thank you very much. I think anyone are welcome to take a, to write you in the chat if they want to. And I can see Matilde has written that there's an activist camp in Deerland organized by Pal uh, Baltic Pipe night attack in June. Um, on Sealand. Ah. <laughs> uh, Matilda, I don't know if you want to add a few words on that. No? I, I can add a few words. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's just like to, uh, yeah, comment on Anis and uh, comment. There will be an activist camp in June. I think it's the second weekend. This is an event on Facebook and it's organized by the Baltic Pipe Night Tech Network. Um, 
and it's gonna be something which will without saying too much prepare some actions against the baltic pipeline which is uh, being constructed yeah from uh, the western part of denmark to the eastern part um yeah so i think it's it's a very good opportunity to get together people from around this small country but still like a country um yeah and be inspired by esteban's very nice presentation uh, and the resistance from from around the world yeah nice any other questions for esteban's presentation or for the activities taking place in denmark I have one question about the presentation. Um, it was really interesting to hear about all the different forms of like activism and resistance and how you can build like a global movement. Um, but I was wondering, what do you think of like other ways of influencing? You were saying that um, it's like a big hypocrisy that countries are saying one thing and doing something else for the companies. What do you think of, for example, efforts to make a binding treaty for businesses through the UN that I know that some organizations are working with. Yes, that's actually the way to go. And I think the, the civil disobedience actions are just one way to accelerate that, to precipitate that to happen. What we need, for example, in Spain, I was talking to some people trying to see uh, it, it seemed pretty likely that someone in the future could push, like a congressman of Spain, could push a law that could demand companies to certify the origin of the gas they bring. If you force them to certify, just like you have to certify when you buy a fish in uh, Berlin, they tell you if it comes from Fukushima, right? To certify the origin and to certify that it, it's not fracked. If we could just, that would be a small step, but it would be a huge victory because if we could, just having that passed across Europe, it could stop all of these terminals. The terminals are being built because of fracking. The gas is expanding because of fracking. There is no conventional, if it was just up to the conventional gas, all of this would not be happening. I also agree that the conventional is not the way to go, but at least to stop fracking, which is a major driver of climate change, is a great victory in the right direction and then we can increase the pressure but definitely the pressure will come in the form of of documents like that and what you just suggested like holding the companies making them sign something that they have to commit to not do something that they're doing in like the human rights violations and so on anything that restricts their capacity to destroy the planet and the people is great Nice. Um, I also have a question. I think I find it very interesting uh, the way the Antinians are, are making a movement in, in Antina locally and how people are gathering around to support, um, support the local movements around and how Fridays for Futures are also um, gathering. But what's the security situation for, for the locals? Uh, you're sitting here in Europe now, um, not capable of returning uh, currently, but what's the local situation for the indigenous or more vulnerable groups who, who don't have the opportunity to leave? There is a very good article that I recommend everyone from The Guardian, how the Mapuche of Argentina, is the title is they pay a high price for the Argentina fracking dream, you can Google it. Um, they are, uh, the indigenous people pay the highest price, their communities are displaced, they die of disease, and they are completely underreported because nobody will tell you, the doctors will not sign a death certificate that says the cause was the chemicals of fracking. So it's a very bad situation, but in the case of Mendoza, where I was living, there is no... Uh, not so much indigenous population, there is no big communities. Most of them are in the next province south, which is Neuquén. And in the case of Mendoza, it's a mostly um, Im immigrant uh, society. Many Spanish and Italian descendants, farmers, agriculture, uh, winemaking. 
And in that case, it's not as easy to, and it's a pretty conservative society, a very religious, and it's not as easy for the government to, to disappear them. So what they do is to create legal proceedings against you. If you become troublesome, they make up charges like they did against me. And I became the person with most charges in Argentina for fighting fracking, most criminal um, cases in Argentina. Uh, insane, like the one I told you for public intimidation and things like that. And um, the same they did to many others. They just make up charges when someone gets out of line and then everyone else learns from this that they should not get involved. So what they do is they begin to demobilize the people and from being tens of thousands in 2018, we ended up being a few hundreds in the streets at the beginning of 2019, right before I had to leave. Um, in 2018, one of the cases brought against me was by the mayor of my city, who was following orders of the governor, and he and I were supposed to face each other uh, at a legal hearing where he was expecting I would apologize because otherwise he would send me to jail. He was expecting I would be apologizing and making a ridicule of myself and just uh, that would be the end of everything. But instead, what I did is I went to this Facebook group and I called on the entire city to come if they wanted to see somebody finally tell the politicians the truth on their fucking faces. So a lot of people came and I knew that this strategy would work because he would not show up because people were so angry and he was already avoiding public acts to not be booed so that he did not show up. And in the end, he, had, he lost this case and um, he had to lift the charges. It was, it was the, most, the biggest ridicule of his political life. And um, I'm telling you that because that happened in 2018. If that were to happen in 2019, nobody would come because people are afraid. People were staying at home. So I could be easily killed or put in jail as they were planning to do. And I was getting death threats. And so we decided with my girlfriend who's from Germany, we were building an eco village in Argentina and uh, decided to put that to a halt. And for, for the time being, we are in Germany, but I'm only doing, you know, I'm doing this fight also so that I can go back to my homeland because I still hold the hope that we can stop this insanity. And then my farm, the eco village project can be back to life and I can have a future there. I don't want to be in Berlin. Thank you very much. And uh, I think time is up for now, but thank you so much for, for your presentation and for participating in our webinar. Um, you've given us a lot of uh, great information about fracking and about um, how this system is uh, out of proportions and also a great motivation saying that we can actually do something here from Europe and our mobilization and um, hindering new LNG uh, storage facilities to be built actually matters. Um, yeah, and from global action side, I just would like to say that thank you so much and I'm sure we'll see you on the streets somewhere or at some activities around Europe. And for the audience, if you would like to hear more about what we're doing global action, then go to our uh, webpage, Africa. Uh, .dk. And you can also find us on Facebook or write to us wherever you find us and we will uh, give you information about how to take action. Um, for next week, we'll have Ilhan, I think, maybe another from our uh, partners in Mozambique talking about how Danish um, investments in, in gas uh, activities in Mozambique is affecting uh, local lives down there. But thank you so much for, for participating to all of you. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.